The sin is contained in these words is in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, where your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Number one. The first thing occurring in the words, according to our former distribution of them, relating to the sin mentioned, is the persons of the sinners. They were their fathers, the progenitors of them to whom the apostle wrote. And they are in the next verse further described by their multitude. They were a whole generation. I was grieved with that generation. Who these were was declared before in the exposition of the words, and it is plain from the story who were intended. It was the people that came up out of Egypt with Moses, all of whom that were above twenty years of age at their coming into the wilderness, because of their manifold sins and provocations, died there. Caleb and Joshua only accepted, so the Lord threatened, Numbers 14, verses 26 to 30. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, As you have spoken in mine ear, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. And all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua the son of Nun. And so it came to pass, for when the people were numbered again in the plains of Moab, it is said, Among these there was not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron the priests numbered. When they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai, that is, besides these two who are accepted by name, Numbers 26, 64 and 65. Now here are John Owen's observations of this text, that the examples of our forefathers are of use and concernment to us, and objects of our deepest consideration. God in his dealings with them laid in instruction for their posterity. And when parents do well, when they walk with God, they beat the path of obedience plain for their children. And when they miscarry, God sets their sins as buoys to warn them who come after them of the shells that they split upon. Be not as your fathers, a stiff-necked generation, is a warning that he oft repeats. And it is in the scripture an eminent part of the commendation or discommendation of any that they walked in the way of their progenitors, where any of the good kings of Judah are testified to for their integrity. This is still one part of the testimony given to them, that they walked in the way of David their father, in the pass that he had trod before them. And on the other side, it is a brand on many of the wicked kings of Israel, that they walked in the ways of Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Their examples, therefore, are of concernment to us, First, because oft times the same kind of temptations are continued to the children that the fathers were exercised with. Thus we find in experience that some temptations are peculiar to a nation, some to a family, for a number of generations, which produce peculiar national sins and family sins, so that at least they are prevalent in them. So the apostle charges national sins on the Cretans from the testimony of Epimedes, who had observed them amongst them. Titus 1 verse 12, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, lying, dissimulation, cruelty, and sloth, were the sins of that nation from one generation to another. Children learning them from the example of their parents. So many families for a long season have been infamous for cruelty or deceit or the like. And these hereditary sins have proceeded in part from hereditary temptations. Some are inlaid in their natural constitutions, and some are inseparably annexed under some special course of life and conversation, in which persons of the same family succeed one another. Now it is a great warning to men to consider what sad events have befallen them that went before them by yielding to those temptations which they themselves are exercised with again. There is a blessing or a curse that lies secretly hid in the ways of progenitors. There is a revenge for the children of the disobedient to the third and fourth generation, and a blessing on the posterity of the obedient for a longer continuance. 
The very heathen acknowledge this by the light of nature. The design is what we have asserted of the traduction of punishment from wicked parents to their posterity. But there are conditions of the avoidance of the curse and enjoyment of the blessing. When fathers have made themselves obnoxious to the displeasure of God by their sins, let their posterity know that there is an addition of punishment coming upon them beyond what is in an ordinary course of providence due to them if they continue in the same sins. So God tells Moses in a matter of the golden calf which Aaron had made, when he had prevailed with him not immediately to destroy the whole people. Nevertheless, he says, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them, Exodus 32, verse 34. That is, if by their future sins and idolatry they shall provoke me to visit and punish them, I will add to their punishment something from the desert of this sin of their forefathers. So it is that the proverb among the Jews, that there is no evil that befalls him, but it has in it some grain of the golden calf, says Rashi. He will mix a little somewhat of the guilt of the sin with the rest of their sins. And therefore the same word of visiting is here used as in the threatening in the commandment in Exodus 20 verse 5. And when one generation after another shall persist in the same provoking sins, the weight of God's indignation grows so heavy that ordinarily in one part or other it begins to fall within the third or fourth generation. And does it not concern men to consider what have been the ways of their forefathers, lest there lie a secret consuming curse against them and the guilt of their sins? Repentance and forsaken their ways wholly intercept the progress of the curse, and set a family at liberty from a great and ancient debt to the justice of God. So God states this manner at large in Ezekiel 18. Men know not what arrears may by this means be chargeable on their inheritances, much more it may be than all they are worth is able to answer. There is no avoidance of the writ for satisfaction that has gone out against them, but by turning out of the way in which they are pursued. The same is the case of the blessing that is stored for the posterity of the obedient, provided they are found in the way of their forefathers. These things render them in their ways objects of our consideration. For moreover, observation 13, it is a dangerous condition for children to boast of the privilege of their fathers and to imitate their sins. This is almost continually the state of the Jews. They were still boasting of their progenitors and constantly walking in their sins. This they are everywhere in the Bible charged with, Numbers 32, verse 14. This a Baptist reflected on in his first dealing with them, bring forth, saith he, fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves we have Abraham to our father, Matthew 3, verses 8 and 9. On every occasion they still cried out, we have Abraham to our father. He was so highly favored of God and first received the promises. For his sake and by his means they expected to be saved, temporarily and eternally. Abraham sits at the gates of hell, they would say, and will not permit that any transgressors of Israel shall go in there, a great reserve against all their sins, but that it will deceive them when they are past relief. It is true they had on this account many privileges, as our apostle testifies in a number of places, Romans 3, verses 1 and 2, Romans 9, verses 4 and 5, and so he esteemed them to be as to his own personal interest in them, Philippians 3, 4 and 5. But while they trusted to them and continued in the sins of them who had abused them, it turned to their further ruin, Matthew 23, 29 to 32 and let their example deter others from countenancing themselves and privileges of any kind while they come short of personal faith and obedience. Observation 14 A multitude joining in any sin gives it a great aggravation. Those here that sinned were all the persons of one entire generation. This made it a formal, open rebellion, a conspiracy against God, a design, as it were, to destroy his kingdom and to leave him no subjects in the world. When many conspire in the same sin, it is a great inducement to others to follow. So is that caution in the law in Exodus 23, verse 2, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. 
The law, indeed, has a special respect to judgment and causes of differences among men. But there is a general direction in the law for our whole course. Thou shalt not be after many, or great men, unto evils. Take heed of the inclination of a multitude unto evil, lest you are also carried away with their error and sin. And this aggravates the sin of many. It does so also that the opposition to God in it is open and notorious, which tends greatly to his dishonor in the world. And what resentment God has of the provocation that lies in it is fully expressed in Numbers chapter 14, from verse 20 to verse 35, speaking of the sin of the congregation and their unbelief and murmuring against him. In the first place, he engages himself by his oath to vindicate his glory from the reproach which they had cast upon it, verse 21. As truly as I live, he says, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Some take these words to be only an asseveration of that which follows, as if God had said, as truly as I live, and as the earth is filled with my glory, all these men shall perish. But the words rather contain the principal matter of the oath of God. He swears that, as they, by their conjunct sin and rebellion, they had dishonored him in the world, so he, by his works of power and vengeance on them, would fill the earth again with his glory. And there is in the following words a representation of a great commotion with great indignation. They have, he says, seen my miracles and have tempted me now these ten times. Verse 22. The Hebrew doctors scrupulously reckon up these temptations. The first, they say, is in Exodus 14.11 when they said, because there were no graves in Egypt. The second in Marah, Exodus 15.24. The people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? The third, in the desert of Zen, Exodus 16, 2 and 3, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron and said, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots. The fourth, when they left manna until the morning, Exodus 16, 19 and 20, and Moses said, Let no man leave of it till the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not to Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank. The fifth was when some of them went to gather manna on the Sabbath day, Exodus sixteen twenty-seven and 28, which God called their refusing to keep his commandments and his laws. The sixth was in Rephidim, at the waters of Mirabah, Numbers 22 to 13. The seventh in Horeb, when they made the calf, Exodus 32. The eighth at Tabera, Numbers 11, verses 1 to 3. The ninth at Kibroth, Hata'ava, Numbers 11, 31 to 34. The tenth upon the return of the spies, Numbers 14. Thus are the ten temptations reckoned up by some of the Jews and by others of them that are enumerated with some little alteration. But whether the exact number of ten be intended in the expression is very uncertain. It seems rather to intend multiplied temptations expressed with much indignation. So Jacob, when he chode with Laban, told him, Thou hast changed my wages ten times, Genesis thirty-one forty-one. That is frequently, which he so expressed in his anger and provocation. So does God hear, Ye have tempted me these ten times, that is, so often, so often, so far, that I neither can nor will bear with you any longer. In a whole discourse which sinners ought to read and tremble at, there is represented, as it were, such a rising of anger and indignation at the face of God, such a commotion of soul and displeasure, both made use of to declare an unchangeable will of punishing, it scarce appears again in the scripture. So it is for a multitude to transgress against God, as it were, by a joint conspiracy. Such issues will all national apostasies and provocations receive. And this is the first general part of the example proposed to consideration, namely, the person sinning with the observations that arise from thence. Number two. The second is the matter or quality of their sin, which is referred to two heads. Their provocation in the provocation in the day of temptation, and number two, they're tempting of him. They tempted me and proved me. 
Their sin consisted in their provoking. It seems not to be any one particular sin, but the whole carriage of the people in the actions reflected on that is intended, and that not at any one time, but in their whole course. The word in the original, as was declared, signifies to chide, to strive, to contend, and that in the words of Isaiah 45, verse 9, woe unto him that striveth with his maker. And how does, or may he do it? Shall the clay say to him that made it, and so on? It is by saying, by speaking against him, that he may so strive with him. But the apostle has expressed it by a word denoting the effect of that chiding that is an exacerbation or provocation. The expression of the actions here intended in the places before mentioned, Exodus 17, Numbers 20, verse 13, the chiding of the people, as we observed before, is directly said to be with Moses, as their tempting afterwards is of the Lord. Thus Moses says unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? Exodus 17, verse 2. But it is also said expressly, They strove, the same word, with the Lord, Numbers 20:13. The meaning is that striving or chiding, being properly in altercation with or in words, Moses, and not God, was the immediate object of their chiding, but because it was about and concerning the works of God, which Moses had no relation to, but as he was his minister, servant, and employed by him, the principal object of their chiding as formerly a sin was also God himself. In striving with Moses, they strove with him, and in chiding with Moses, they chode with him. This expression, then, in general, comprises all the sinful actions of that people against God under the ministry of Moses. There are two things to be considered in this manner of provocation. Number one, the sin that is included in it. Number two, the event or consequent of it. God was provoked. The former seems firstly intended in the Hebrew word, the latter in the Greek. Number one. For the sin intended, it is evident from the story that it was unbelief acting itself by murmuring and complaints. The same for the substance of it, by which also they tempted God. This the apostle declares to have been the great provoking sin, verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in by reason of unbelief. That was the sin which so provoked God, is that he swore in his wrath that they should not enter into his wrath. Yet it is not their unbelief absolutely considered that is intended, but as it brought forth the effects of chiding with Moses and murmuring against God, which on all occasions they fell into. Though unbelief itself, especially in such a season, be a provoking sin, yet this murmuring and chiding so added to its provocation that it is directly laid on their accounts. But they also, as the Apostle says, are to be resolved into their spring or cause, that is, unbelief. They are but a special sign, circumstance, or effect of their unbelief. Number two, the effect of this sin was a provocation or exacerbation of God. The original comes from the words provoking, inciting, stimulating, embittering, sometimes passively for indignation, perturbation, sorrow, grief, trouble, and so on. In a whole, it includes the embittering of the mind of its object with an excitation to anger, displeasure, and wrath. Now, these things are ascribed to God only by an anthropopathy, such effects being usually wrought in the minds of the best men when they are unjustly and ungratefully dealt with. God, to show men the nature of their sins, ascribes them to himself. His mind is not embittered, moved, or changed, but men have deserved to be dealt with as if it were so. Jeremiah 8.19, 2 Kings 21.15, Isaiah 65.3, Jeremiah 25.7, 2 Chronicles 28.25. Now this provocation of God by their unbelief, acting itself in murmuring, chiding, and complaining, is further expressed from the season of it. It was in the day of temptation, the day of Massah. The denomination is taken from the name of the place where they first murmured for water and tempted God by the discovery of their unbelief. As it was called Meribah from the contention, chiding, and provoking, so it was called Massa from the tempting of God there, the day of temptation. And this expression, not the addition of a new sin to that of provocation, is intended, but only a description of the sin and season of that sin. 
It was in the day of temptation that God was so provoked by them. How also they tempted him we shall see afterwards. Now as this day signally began upon the temptation at Meribah, so it continued through the whole course of the people's peregrination in the wilderness, their multiplied tempting of God made this whole time a day of temptation. Now let's consider some further observation. 15. The sinful actings of men against those who deal with them in the name of God and about the works or will of God are principally against God himself. The people chode with Moses, but when God came to call it to an account, he says they strove with him and provoked him. So Moses told the people to take them off from their vain pretenses and coverings of their unbelief in Exodus 16.2. The whole congregation murmured against Moses and Aaron. But he says in verse 7, The Lord hears your murmurings against him, and what are we that you murmur against us? As if he had said, Mistake not yourselves. It is God and not us that you have to do with in this manner. What you suppose you speak only against us is indeed directly, though not immediately, spoken against God. So God himself informed Samuel, Upon the repining of the people against him, They have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them, because he ruled them immediately in the name of God, 1 Samuel 8, verse 7. They pretended weariness of the government of Samuel, but were indeed weary of God and his rule, and so what was done against him, God took as done against himself. And under the New Testament, our Savior in particular applies this rule to the dispensers of the gospel, Luke ten sixteen. He says, He that hears you, hears me, and he that despises you, despises me, and he that despises me, despises him that sent me. The preachers of the gospel are sent by Christ, and therefore their opposition and contempt first reflect dishonor upon him and through him upon God himself. And the reason of this is because in their work they are representatives of God himself. They act in his name and in his stead as his ambassador, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. Now then, saith the apostle, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ, dead, be ye reconciled to God. They treat with men as sent of God in his name about the affairs of Christ. The violation of an ambassador amongst men is always esteemed to redound unto the dishonor of him by whom he is employed. For it is he to whom the injury and affront are principally intended, especially if it be done to him in the discharge of his office. Nor are kings or states ever more highly provoked than when an injury is offered or an affront done to their ambassadors. The Romans of old utterly destroyed Tarentum in Italy and Corinth in Greece on that account. And occasions of the same nature have been like of late to fill the world with blood and tumult. And the reason is because, according to the light of nature, what is done immediately against a representative as such is done directly and intentionally against a person represented. So it is in this case. The enmity of men is against God himself, against his way, his works, his will, which his ambassadors do but declare. But these things absolutely are out of their reach. They cannot reach them nor hurt them nor will they own directly in opposition to them. Therefore are pretenses invented by men against those who are employed by God, that under their covert they may execute their rage against God himself. So Amaziah, priest of Bethel, complained to Jeroboam the king, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. It is not because he preached against his idolatry or denounced the judgments of God against the sins of men that Amaziah opposes him. No, it is merely on account of his sedition and the danger of the king by it, Amos 7.10. And when, as it is likely, he could not prevail with the king for his destruction, he deals with him personally himself to flee away and so to render himself suspected, verses 12 and 13. He had used an invidious expression concerning him to the king. He has conspired against you, that is, to take away your life. The word is used concerning two kings of Judah, one after another, and the matter ended in their death, Second Chronicles 24-25, Second Chronicles 25-27. 
and it is mostly used for a conspiracy ending in death. And yet all this was from enmity against God and from no affection to the king. Under the shade of such pretenses do men act their opposition to God upon his messengers. God sees that they are all but culverts for their lust and obstinacy. That himself is intended, and he esteems it so accordingly. Instruction lies plain herein for them who, by vainly invented pleas and pretenses, do endeavor to give countenance to their own consciences in opposition to those who speak in the name and treat about the things of God. Let them look to it, though they may so satisfy themselves and imbibe their own prejudices as to think they do God good service when they kill them. Yet they will find things in the issue brought to another account. This lies so clear from what has been spoken that I shall not further insist on it. But let them principally consider this, and thence what is incumbent on them who are called to deal with others in the name of God. First, let them take heed that they neither do nor act nor speak anything but what they have sufficient warrant from him for. It is a dangerous thing to entitle God or his name unto our own imaginations. God will not set a seal of approbation. He will not own a concernment in our lie, though we should think that it tends to his glory, Romans 3, verse 7. Neither will he own what he has done against us as done against himself, unless we stand in his counsels and be found in the ways of his will. There is no object of a more sad consideration than to see some men persecuting others for their errors. They that persecute suppose them in the right as to the matter indifference between them and those whom they do oppress yet do certainly act against God in what they pretend to act for him, for they usurp his authority over the souls and consciences of men, and they that are persecuted do sacrifice their concernments to the darkness of their own minds. God may concern himself in general to own their integrity towards himself, even in their mistakes, but in the particular in which they suffer, he will not own them. Whether, therefore, we are to do or to suffer anything for God, it is of great concern to us to look well to our call or warrant. And then, secondly, when men are secured by the word and spirit of God that their message is not their own, but his that sent them, that they seek not their own glory, but his, they may have hence all desirable grounds of encouragement, support, and consolation in all the straits and temptations they meet with in this world. They can be no more utterly prevailed against, that is, their testimony cannot, than can God himself. So he speaks to Jeremiah, I will make you a fenced, brazen wall. They shall fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you to save you, and to deliver you, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 15, verse 20. And in what they allow God is so far concerned, as to account all that is done against them to be done against himself. Christ is hungry with them, and thirsty with them, and in prison with them, Matthew 25, 35 and 40. Observation 16. Unbelief manifesting itself in a time of trial is a most provoking sin, but will break off all gracious intercourse between himself and such provokers. This is a direct case with these Israelites. They had by their unbelief and murmuring provoked God ten times, as was declared before, but the day of their provocation, the season in which it arrived to its height, came not until this trial mentioned, Numbers 14, upon the return of the spies that went to search the land. Before that time, God often reproved them, was angry with them, and variously punished them, but he still returned to them in a way of mercy and compassion, and still proposed to them an entrance into his rest according to the promise. But when that day once came, when the provocation of their unbelief was come to its height, then he would bear with them no longer, but swears in his wrath that they should not enter into his rest. From that day he took hold of all occasions to exercise severity against them, flooding them away, Psalm 90 verse 5, until that whole evil generation was consumed. And so it was with their posterity as to their church and national state. God sent to them and dealt variously with them by his prophets in several generations. Some of them they persecuted, others they killed, and upon a matter rejected them all, as to the main end of their work and message. 
But yet all this while God spared them and continued them a people and a church. Their provocation was not come to its height. Its last day was not yet come. At length, according to his promise, he sent his son to them. This gave them their last trial. This put them into the same condition with their forefathers in the wilderness, as the apostle plainly intimates in the use of this example. Again, they despised the promises, as their fathers had done in a type and shadow. So did they, when the substance of all promises was tendered and exhibited to them. This is the day of their last provocation, after which God would bear with them no more in a way of patience. But enduring them for the space of near forty years, he utterly rejected them. Sending forth his servants, he slew those murderers and burned up their city. This is that which our Savior at large declares in his parable of the householder and his husbandmen. Matthew twenty one thirty three to 41 And thus in God's dealing with the anti-Christian state, there is a season in which the angel swears that there shall be time no longer, Revelation 10, verse 6, that God would no longer bear with men or forbear them in their provocations and idolatries, but within force give them up unto all sorts of judgment, spiritual and temporal, to their utter confusion. Yea, send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Second Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12 And concerning this day, two things may be observed, that it is uncertain, and that it is unalterable. First, it is uncertain. Men know not when their provocations come or will come to this height. Jerusalem knew not in the entrance of her day that her sin and unbelief were coming to their issue, and so was not awakened to their prevention. No more than the men of Sodom knew when the sun arose that there was a cloud of fire and brimstone hanging over their head. Men in their sins think they will do as at other times as Samson did when his locks were cut, and that things will be made up between God and them as formerly, that they shall yet have space and time for their work and duty. But ere they are aware, they have finished their course and filled up the measure of their sins. For a man also knows not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in a snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. Ecclesiastes 9.12 For the day of the Lord's indignation comes as a snare on them that dwell on the face of the earth. Luke 21.35 And men are often crying peace, peace, when sudden destruction comes upon them. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 When Babylon shall say she sits as a queen and is no widow, her sons being again restored to her, and shall see no sorrow. Then shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. Revelation 18, verses 7 and 8. So is Christ so often said to come as a thief, to manifest how men will be surprised by him in their sins and impenitency. And if the outward peace and the lives of men in this condition be respited for a while, as oft times they are, Yet they are no longer under a dispensation of patience. There is nothing between God and them but anger and wrath. If men knew when would be their last trial, and which were it, we think they would rouse up themselves to a deep consideration of it and a serious compliance with the call of God. But this and the holy will and wisdom of God is always hid from them, until it be too late to make use of it, until it can produce no effects but a few despairing wishes. God will have none of his warnings, none of his merciful dispensations put off or slighted with the hope and expectation of another season by a foolish promising whereof unto themselves men ruin their souls every day. Number two, it is unalterable and irrecoverable. When the provocation of unbelief comes to this height, there is no space or room left for repentance, either on the part of God or the sinner. For men, for the most part, after this, they have no thought of repenting. Either they see themselves irrecoverably, and so grow desperate, or become stupidly senseless and lie down in security. So those false worshippers in the revelation, after time was granted to them no longer, but the plagues of God began to come upon them, it is said they repented not, but bit their tongues for anger and blasphemed God. Instead of repenting of their sins, they rage against their punishment. And if they do change their mind in anything, as Esau did when he saw the blessing was gone, it is not by true repentance, nor shall it be to any effect or purpose. 
So the Israelites finished their sin by murmuring against the Lord upon the return of the spies, and said they would not go up into the land, but would rather return into Egypt, Numbers 14. But after a while they changed their minds, and they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we'll go up into the place which the Lord has promised, verse 40. But what was the issue? Their time was past. The Lord was not among them. The Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill smote them and discomfited them even unto Hormah, verse 45. Their change of mind was not repentance, but a new aggravation of their sin. Repentance also in this manner is hid from the eyes of God. When Saul had finished his provocation, Samuel, denouncing the judgment of God against him, adds, And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, 1 Samuel 15, 29. God firms his sentence and makes it irrevocable by the engagement of his own immutability. There is no change, no alteration, no reprieve, no place for mercy when this day is come and gone, Ezekiel 21:25. Let persons, let churches, let nations take heed lest they fall unawares into this evil day. I say unawares to themselves because they know not when they may be overtaken by it. It is true, all the dangers of it arises from their own negligence, security, and stubbornness. If they will give ear to previous warnings, this day will never come upon them. It may not, therefore, be unworthy our inquiry to search what prognostics men may have into the approach of such a day. First, when persons, churches, or nations have already contracted the guilt of various provocations, they may justly fear that their next shall be their last. You have, saith God to the Israelites, provoke me these ten times, that is, frequently, as has been declared, and now your day is come. You might have considered before that I would not always thus bear with you. Has God then borne with you in one and other provocation, temptation, and backsliding? Take heed lest a great sin lies at the door and be ready to enter upon the next occasion, as God told Cain in Genesis 4-7. If you do not do well, sin lies down at the door. Is a beast ready to enter on the next occasion, the next opening of it? After former provocation, so lies that which shall fill the ephah, and have the talents of lead laid upon it. Take heed, gray hairs are sprinkled upon you, though you perceive it not. Death is at the door. Beware, lest your next provocation be your last. When your transgressions come to three or four, the punishment of your iniquities will not be turned away. When that is come, you may sin while you will or while you can. God will have no more to do with you but in a way of judgment. 2. When repentance upon convictions of provocations lessens or decays, it is a sad symptom of an approaching day in which iniquity will be completed. Useful repentance, that is, that which is of any use in this world for the deferring or retarding of judgment, is commensurate to God's dispensations of patience. When the fixed bounds of it, as it has fixed bounds, are arrived at, all springs of repentance are dried up. When therefore persons fall into the guilt of many provocations, and God given in a conviction of them by his word or providence, they are humbled for them according to their light and principles. If they find their humiliations upon their renewed convictions to grow weak, decay, and lessen in their effects, they do not so reflect upon themselves with self-displicency as formerly nor so stir up themselves to an amendment as they have done upon former warnings and convictions, nor have in such cases their accustomed sense of the displeasure and terror of the Lord. Let them beware, evil is before them, and the fatal season of their utmost provoking is at hand, if not prevented. Number three, when various dispensations of God towards men have been useless and fruitless, when mercies, judgments, dangers, deliverances, signally stamped with respect to the sins of men, but especially the warnings of the word, have been multiplied towards any persons, churches, or nations, and have passed over them without their reformation or recovery. No doubt but judgment is ready to enter, yea, if it be into the house of God itself. Is it thus with any? Is this their estate and condition? Let them please themselves while they please. They are like Jonah, asleep in the ship, whilst it is ready to be cast away on their account. Awake and tremble. You know not how soon a great, vigorous, prevalent temptation may hurry you into your last provocation. They are said also to have tempted God. 
And the temptation when your fathers tempted me, wherein their provocation did consist, and what was the sin which is so expressed, we have declared. We must now inquire what was their tempting of God, of what nature was their sin in it, and in what it consisted. To tempt God is a thing frequently mentioned in the scripture, and condemned as a provoking sin. And it is generally esteemed to consist in a venturing, honor, engaging into any way, work, or duty, without sufficient call, warrant, or rule, upon the account of trusting God in it, or in the neglect of the use of ordinary means in any condition, desiring, expecting, or trusting to any extraordinary assistances or supplies from God. So when men seem rashly to cast themselves into danger, out of a confidence in the presence and protection of God, it is said that they tempt God. And a number of texts of scripture seem to give countenance to this description of the sin of tempting of God. Isaiah 7, 11, and 12. When the prophet bade Ahaz ask a sign of the Lord in the depth or in the height above, he replied, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. That is, I will rest in what you have said and not tempt God by seeking anything extraordinary. And so when Satan tempted our Savior to show his power by casting himself down from a pinnacle of the temple, which was none of his ways, Matthew 4, 7, he answers him by that saying of Deuteronomy 6, 16, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. To venture therefore on anything unwarrantably trust into God for protection is to tempt him. And this is usually and generally allowed as the nature of the sin and sense of this expression. But yet I must needs say that upon the consideration of all the places where mention is made of tempting the Lord, I am forced to embrace another sense of the meaning of this expression, which if it be not utterly exclusive of that already mentioned, yet it is doubtless more frequently intended and does more directly express the sin here condemned. Now this is a distrust of God while we are in any of his ways. After we have received sufficient experiences and instances of his power and goodness to confirm us in the stability and certainty of his promises, thus to do so is to tempt God. And when this frame is found in any, they are said to tempt him, that is, to provoke him by their unbelief. It is not barely and nakedly to disbelieve the promises. It is not unbelief in general, but it is to disbelieve them under some peculiar attestation and experience obtained of the power and goodness of God in their pursuit and towards their accomplishment. When therefore men are engaged into any way of God according to their duty and meeting with opposition and difficulty in it, if they give way to despondency and unbelief, if they have received any signal pledges of his faithfulness, in former effects of his wisdom, care, power, and goodness, they tempt God, and are guilty of the sin here branded and condemned. The most eminent instances of tempting God in the scripture, and which are most frequently mentioned, are these of the Israelites in the wilderness. As they are here represented in the story, so they are called over again, both in the Old Testament and the New, Psalm seventy-eight forty-one. Yea, they turned back and tempted God, and limited the Holy One of Israel. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 9, they tempted Christ. And in what did this temptation consist? It was in this and no other. They would not believe or trust God when they were in his way, after they had received many experiences of his power and presence amongst them. And this is directly expressed in Exodus 17, 7. They tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? They doubted of and questioned his presence and also all the pledges and tokens which he had given them of it. And the sin of theirs the psalmist at large pursues, showing in what it did consist, Psalm 78, 22, and 23. They believed not in God, and trusted not in his salvation, though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven, verse 32. For all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works, verses 41 and 42. They turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remember not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. Thus plain does he make the nature of their sin and tempting of God. It was their distrust and disobeying of him, after they had received so many encouraging evidences of his power, goodness, and wisdom amongst them. 
This and this alone is in the scripture called tempting of God. For that of our Savior, Matthew 4, 7, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It was taken as was observed from Deuteronomy 6, 16, where the following words as, He tempted him in Massa. Now this tempting of God at Massa was that which we have declared, namely, the disbelieving of him after many evidences of his power and faithfulness. And this directly answers the end for which our Savior made use of these words which was to show that he was so far satisfied of God's presence with him and of his being the Son of God that he would not tempt him by desiring other experiences of it, as though what he had already were not sufficient. And the reason why Ahaz said he would not tempt the Lord and ask him a sign was no other but because he believed not either that he would give him a sign or that he would deliver and therefore he resolved to trust to himself and with his money to hire the Assyrians to help him, which he did accordingly in Second Kings 16, 7 and 9. And his sin is called tempting of God from its effect and not from its formal nature. They tempted God, that is, by their unbelief, they provoked him and stirred him up to anger and indignation. And from the discovery of the nature of the sin we may observe that, observation 18, to distrust God, to disbelieve his promises, while a way of duty lies before us, after we have had experiences of his goodness, power, and wisdom, and his dealing with us as a tempting of God and a greatly provoking sin. Distrust of God is a sin that we are apt upon a number of perverse reasonings to indulge ourselves in, and yet there is nothing in which God is more provoked. Now it appears in the proposition laid down, that a number of things are required that a person, a church, a people, may render themselves formally guilty of this sin as, number one, that they be called to or engaged in some special way of God. And this is no extraordinary thing. All believers who attend to their duty will find it to be their state and condition. So were the Israelites in the wilderness. If we are out of the ways of God, our sin may be great, but it is a sin of another nature. It is in his ways that we have his promises, and therefore it is in them, and with reference to them, that we are bound to believe and trust in him, and on the same account in them alone can we tempt God by our unbelief. Number two, that in this way they meet with oppositions, difficulties, hardships, temptations, and this while Satan and the world continue in their power they shall be sure to do. Yea, God himself is pleased oft times to exercise them with a number of things of this nature. So it befell the people in the wilderness. Sometimes they had no bread. Sometimes they had no water. Sometimes enemies assaulted them, and sometimes serpents bit them. Those things which in God's designs are trials of faith and means to stir it up to a diligent exercise in their own natures are grievous and troublesome and in the management of Satan tend to the producing of the sin or tempting of God. Number three, that they have received former experiences of the goodness, power, and wisdom of God in his dealings with them. So had this people done, and this God charges them with when he reproaches them with this sin of tempting him, and this also all believers are or may be made partakers of. He who has no experience of the special goodness and power of God towards him, it has been through his own negligence and want of observation, and not from any defect in God's dispensations, as he leaves not himself without witness towards the world, and that he does them good, sending them rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling their hearts with food and gladness, nor no more is he wanting towards all believers and giving them special tokens of his love, care, and kindness towards them. For he is the Savior of all men, but especially of those that believe, First Timothy 4.10. But as the most in the world take no notice of the effects of his care and goodness towards them, so many believers are negligent in treasuring up experiences of a special care and love towards them. Yet this doesn't hinder, but that the ways and dealings of God are indeed such as have been declared. Now where these things concur, the distrust of God is a high provocation of him. It is unbelief, the worst of sins expressing itself to the greatest disadvantage of God's glory. The height of aggravations, for what can God do more for us, and what can we do more against Him? Surely when He has revealed His ways to us, and made known to us our duty, when He has given us pledges of His presence with us, and of His 
owning of us, so as to seal and ascertain his promises to us. Then for us, upon the opposition of creatures or worldly difficulties, about outward, temporary, perishing things, for their power and efficacy extends no further, to disbelieve and distrust him, it must needs be a high provocation to the eyes of his glory. But alas, how frequently do we contract the guilt of the sin, both in our personal family and more public concernments. A due consideration of this lays, without doubt, a manner of deep humiliation before us. And this is the second general head insisted on by the Apostle in the example proposed, namely, the nature of the sin or sins which the people fell into, and which he intends to dehort his Hebrews from. Number three. The third general head of this discourse contains the triple aggravation of the sin of the people in their provoking and tempting of God. From the place in which they so sinned, it was in the wilderness. Secondly, from the means they had to the contrary, they saw the works of God. Number three, from the continuance of the use of those means and the duration of their sin under them, it was thus for forty years, they saw my works. Forty years. For these, as they are circumstances of the story, so they are aggravations of the sin mentioned in it. They thus dealt with God in the wilderness. What wilderness is intended we showed before in the exposition of the words. And however there may be a peculiar respect to that part of the wilderness in which the definitive sentence of their exclusion from the land of Canaan was given out against them, which was in the wilderness of Paran, Numbers 12.16, at the very borders of the land that they were to possess, as appears in chapter 1440. Yet because the time of forty years is mentioned, which was the whole time of the people's peregrination in the deserts of Arabia, I take the word to comprehend the whole. Here in this wilderness they provoked and tempted God, and this contains a great aggravation of their sin for, number one, this is a place in which they were brought into liberty, after they and their forefathers had been in sore bondage to the Egyptians for a number of ages. This is a mercy promised to them, and which they cried out for in the day of their oppression. They cried, and their cry came up to God by reason of the bondage, Exodus 2.23. Now to misuse their liberty, to make an entrance into it by this rebellion against God, it was a provoking circumstance. Number two. It was a place in which they lived solely and visibly upon God's daily extraordinary provision for them. Should he have withheld a continual working of miracles in their behalf, both they and theirs must have utterly perished. This could not but have affected them with love and fear. Great preservatives of obedience had they not been extremely stupid and obdurate. Number three, they were in a place where they had none to tempt them, to provoke them, to entice them to sin, unless they willfully sought them out unto that very end and purpose, as they did in the case of Midian. The people now dwelt alone and were not reckoned among the nations. Afterwards, indeed, when they dwelt among other nations, they learned their manners. But as that was no excuse for their sin, so this was a great aggravation of it, that here it sprung merely from themselves and their own evil heart of unbelief, continually prone to depart from the living God. Number two, it was a place in which they continually saw the works of God, which is the second general head mentioned in the aggravation of their sin. They saw my works, and this aggravated their sin on many accounts, from the evidence that they had that such works were wrought, and that they were wrought of God. They saw them. This Moses laid weight on Deuteronomy 5, 3, and 4. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but us even us, who are all of us here alive this day. The Lord talked with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire, not with our fathers, that is, say, some our forefathers who died in Egypt and heard not the voice of God in Horeb, or not with our fathers, that is, only. Their fathers were alive at the giving of the law, but the covenant was not made with them only, but with us also. I think that God shows, in these words of Moses, his indignation against all the provoking generation of their fathers in that wilderness, and affirms his covenant was not made with them, because they despised it, and didn't receive any benefit by it. For it had a peculiar respect to the land of Canaan, concerning which God swore that they should not enter in it. 
It was not with them, he says, whom God despised and regarded not, but with you who are now ready to enter into the promised land that this covenant was made. Hebrews 8 verse 9. The ground why I produce this place is to show what weight is to be laid on immediate transactions with God, personal seeing of his works. Herein they had an advantage above those who can only say with the psalmist in Psalm 44, 1, We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us what work you did in their days and the times of old. They saw with their own eyes what was but told or reported to others. And in this they had a double advantage first in point of evidence. They had the highest and most unquestionable evidence that the works mentioned were wrought and wrought of God. They saw them. And this is clearly the most satisfactory evidence concerning miraculous works. So our Savior chose those to be the witnesses of his miracles who had been spectators of them. Secondly, in point of efficacy for their end, things seen and beheld have naturally a more effectual influence on the minds of men than those which they only hear of or are told them. This therefore greatly aggravates their sin that they themselves saw these works of God which were signal means of preserving them from it. Number two, from the nature of the works themselves, which they saw. They were such as were imminent effects of the properties of God and means of their demonstration, and therein of the revelation of God to them. Some of them were works of power, as his dividing of the sea, whose waves roared. Some of majesty and terror, as the dreadful appearances and thunders, lightnings, fire, smoke, and an earthquake. At the giving of the law. Some of severity and indignation against sin as his drowning the Egyptians, the opening of the earth to swallow up Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and the plagues that befell themselves, some of the privilege, favor, love, and grace, as the giving of the law, entrusting them with his oracles and forming them into a church and state, Isaiah 57, 16. Some of care and providence for their continual supply and giving water from the rock and bread from heaven and preserving their garments from wax and old. Some of direction and protection is in the cloud and pillar of fire to guide, direct, and refresh them night and day in what waste howling wilderness, in all which works God abundantly manifested his power, goodness, wisdom, grace, faithfulness, tendering them the highest security of his accomplishing his promises, that they rejected not their interest in them by their unbelief, and it is a manner well worthy of consideration how excellently and pathetically Moses pleads all these works of God with him in the book of Deuteronomy. And all these works of God were excellent means to have wrought up the hearts of the people to faith and obedience, and to that end and purpose where they wrought all of them. This he frequently declared while they were under the accomplishment, and thereon afterwards reproaches them with their unbelief. What could be more suited to beget in the minds of men a due apprehension of the greatness, goodness, and faithfulness of God than they were? And what is a more effectual motive to obedience in such apprehensions? The neglect of them, therefore, carries along with it a great aggravation of sin to tempt God, to murmur against him as though he could not or would not provide for them or make good his word to them, while they saw, as it were, every day, those great and marvelous works which had such an impression of his glorious image upon them, it made way for their irrecoverable destruction. Number three. The third aggravation of the sin of this people is taken from the time of their continuance in it. Under the use of the means to the contrary before insisted on, it was forty years. The patience of God was extended towards them, and his works were wrought before them, not for a week or a month, or a year, but for forty years together. And this increases the greatness and strangeness of this dispensation, both on the part of God and theirs also, on the part of God that he should bear with their manners so long, when they had so often deserved to be destroyed as one man, and which he had threatened often to do, and on their part, this so long a course of patience, accompanied with so many works of power and mercy, all of them for their instruction, most of them to their present benefit and advantage, should have no effect upon them to prevent their continuance in their sin, to their ruin. And these are the aggravations of their sin which the psalmist collects from the circumstances of it, and which the apostle repeats for our warning and instruction, 
And this we shall draw out in the ensuing observations. Observation 19. No place. No retiredness. No solitary wilderness will secure men from sin or suffering, provocation or punishment. These persons were in a wilderness where they had many motives and encouragements to obedience. And no means of seduction and outward temptation from others. Yet there they sinned and there they suffered. They sinned in the wilderness and their carcasses fell in the wilderness. They filled that desert with sins and graves. And the reason of it is because no place as such can of itself exclude the principles and causes either of sin or punishment. Men have the principles of their sin in themselves, in their own hearts, which they cannot leave behind them, or yet get off by shifting of places or changing their stations. And the justice of God, which is a principal cause of punishment, is no less in the wilderness than in the most populous cities. The wilderness is no wilderness to him. He can find his paths and all its intricacies. The Israelites came here on necessity, and so they found it with them. And in after ages some have done so by choice. They have retired into wildernesses for the furtherance of their obedience and devotion. In this very wilderness on the top of Sinai, there is at this day a monastery of persons professing themselves to be religious, and they live there to increase religion in them. I once for some days converse with their chief, they call him Archimandrite, here in England. For aught I could perceive, he might have learned as much elsewhere. And indeed, what has been the issue of that undertaken in general? For the most part, to their old lusts, men added new superstitions until they made themselves an abomination to the Lord and utterly useless in the world, yea, burdensome into human society. Such persons are like the men of Sukkoth, whom Gideon taught with the thorns and briars of the wilderness. Judges 8.16 They learn nothing by it but the sharpness of the thorns and the greatness of their own folly. No more did they at best learn anything from their wilderness retirements but the sharpness of the place, which is a part of the punishment of their sin, and no means sanctified for the furtherance of their obedience. These two things, then, are evident first, that the principle of men's unbelief and disobedience is in themselves and in their own hearts, which leaves them not upon any change of their outward condition. Number two. That no outward state of things, whether voluntarily chosen by ourselves, or we be brought into it by the providence of God, will either cure or conquer, or can restrain the inward principles of sin and unbelief. I remember old Jerome somewhere complains that when he was in his horrid cave at Bethlehem, his mind was frequently among the delicacies of Rome. And this will teach us first, in every outward condition, to look principally to our own hearts. We may expect great advantages from various conditions but shall indeed meet with none of them unless we fix in water the root of them in ourselves. One thinks he could serve God better in prosperity if freed from the perplexities of poverty, sickness, or persecution. Others, that they should serve him better if called to afflictions and trials. Some think it would be better with them if retired and solitary. Others, if they had more society and company. But the only way indeed to serve God better is to abide in our station or condition and in this to get better hearts. It is Solomon's advice in Proverbs 4.23, Above or before every watcher keep and keep thy heart. It is good to keep the tongue, and it is good to keep the feet, and it is good to keep the way, as he further declares in that place. But he says, above all, keep and keep your heart. And he adds a great reason for his caution. For he says, out of it are the issues of life. Life and death and the means and causes of them do come out of the heart. So our Savior instructs us that in our hearts lie our treasures. What they are, that are we, and nothing else. Thence are all our actions drawn forth, which not only smell of the cask, but receive thence principally their whole moral nature, whether they are good or bad. And secondly, look for all relief and for help against sin merely from grace. A wilderness will not help you, nor a paradise. And the one Adam sinned, and whom we all sinned, and the other all Israel sinned, who were an example to us all. Men may, to good purpose, go into a wilderness to exercise grace and principles of truth, when the acting of them is denied elsewhere. 
But it is to no purpose to go into a wilderness to seek for these things. Their dwelling is in the love and favor of God, and nowhere else can they be found. Job 28, 12-28 Do not expect that mercies of themselves will do you good, or that afflictions will do you good, that the city or the wilderness will do you good. It is grace alone that can do you good. And if you find inward benefits by outward things, it is merely from the grace that God is pleased to administer and dispense with them. And he can separate them when he pleases. He can give mercies that shall be so materially, but not eventually, like the quells which fed the bodies of the people while lean has possessed their souls. And he can send affliction that shall have nothing in it but affliction, present troubles leading on to future troubles. Learn then in all places in every state and condition to live in the freedom, riches, and efficacy of grace for other helps, other advantages have we none. Thirdly, let us learn that whithersoever sin can enter, punishment can follow. Though vengeance seems to have a lame foot, yet it will hunt sin until it overtake the sinner. Psalm 140 verse 11. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overtake him. Go where he will, the fruits of his own evil and violence. The punishment due to them shall hunt him and follow him. And though it should sometimes appear to be out of sight or off from the scent, yet it will recover its view and chase until it has brought him to destruction. To thrustings down until he be utterly thrust down, saith the Targum. The angel of death shall hunt him until he thrust him down into hell. Punishment will follow sin into the wilderness, where it is separated from all the world, and climb up after it to the top of the Tower of Babel, where all the world conspire to defend it. It will follow it into the dark, the dark corners of their hearts and lives, and overtake them in the light of the world. God has an eye of revenge that nothing can escape. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I feel heaven and earth, saith the Lord, Jeremiah twenty three twenty four. God declares whence it is that none can hide from his presence or escape his justice. It is from his omnipresence. He is everywhere, and all places are alike to him. Adam, when he had sinned, went behind a tree, and others, they would go under rocks and mountains, but all is one. Vengeance will find them out. This is that which the barbarian thought would not let a murderer live, however he might escape for a season, Acts 28.4. Observation 20. Great works of providence are a great means of instruction, and a neglect of them as to their instructive end is the great aggravation of the sin of those who live when and where they are performed. They saw my works, saith God, works great and wonderful, and yet continued in their sin and disobedience. This heightened their sin and hastened their punishment. We shall take an instance in one of the works here intended, which will acquaint us with the design, end, and use of them all. And this shall be the appearance of the majesty of God on Mount Sinai at the giving of the law. The works accompanying it consisted much in things miraculous, strange, and unusual, as thunder, lightning, fire, smoke, and earthquakes, the sound of a trumpet, and the like. The usual working of the minds of men toward these unusual effects of the power of God is to gaze on them with admiration and astonishment. This God forbids in them, Exodus 19.21, charge the people lest they break through to the Lord to gaze. This is not the inner design of God in these works of his power, in these appearances and evidences of his majesty, that men should gaze at them to satisfy their curiosity. What then was aimed at in and by them? It was to instruct them to a due fear and awful reverence of God, whose holiness and majesty were represented to them, that they might know him as a consuming fire. And this was declared in the issue. For the people coming up to a due fear of God for the present and promising obedience thereon, God took it well of them and approved it in them, as that which answered the design of his works, Deuteronomy 5, 23-29. And it came to pass, when he heard a voice, out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that ye came near unto me. These are the words of Moses to the people, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, Behold, the Lord our God has showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee. 
and we will hear it and do it. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spake unto me. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Oh, that there were such an heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. They speak, or rather he speaks in them. Now that they may be instructive to us, a number of things are required first, that we take notice of them, and notice of them to be his. Some are so staid and so obstinate, are so full of self and other things that they will take no notice at all of any of the works of God. His hand is lifted up, and they will not see, they will not behold it. He passes by them in his works on the right hand and on the left, but they don't perceive it. Others, though they take notice of the works themselves, that they will not take notice of them to be his. Like the Philistines, they knew not whether the strange plague that consumed them and destroyed their cities were God's hand or a chance. But until we seriously consider them and really own them to be the works of God, we can make no improvement of them. Number two, we are to inquire into the special meaning of them. This is wisdom and that which God requires at our hands. So Micah 6, 9. The voice of the Lord cries to the city, and a man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod and who has appointed it. The voice of the Lord is often taken for the power of God, manifesting itself in its effects and mighty works. In the sense it is repeated six or seven times in one psalm, Psalm 29, 3-9. The voice of God here, then, is the works of God. And what do they do? They have a voice. They cry to the city. The voice of God in his rod does so. That is, his afflicting and correcting works is in the end of the verse. It cries to the city. That is the city of God, Jerusalem or the church, though some think that it cries to excite or stir up men, that is to repentance and amendment. And what is the issue? The man of wisdom, we say, it is wisdom or rather substance, that is the substantial wise man who gives no place to vanity and lightness. He shall see the name of God, that is he shall discern the power and wisdom of God in his work, and not only so, but the mind of God also in them, which is awful soul signified by his name. John 17, 6. And so it follows, hear ye the rod. They are works of the rod or correction that he speaks of. This he commands us to hear, that is to understand. First, that we consider and be well acquainted with our own condition. If we are ignorant of it, we shall understand nothing of the mind of God and his dispensations. Security and sin will take away all understanding of judgments. Let God thunder from heaven in the revelation of his wrath against sin, yet such persons will be secure still. God does not often utterly destroy men with great and tremendous destructions before he has given them previous warnings of his indignation. But yet men that are secure in sin will know so little of the sense of them that they will be crying peace and safety when their final destruction is seasoned upon them, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. God speaks out of the curse of the law and his works of judgment, for by this is the wrath of God revealed from heaven against the ungodliness of men, Romans 1, 18. But yet when men hear the voice of the curse so spoken out, if they are secure, they will bless themselves and say, they shall have peace, though they add drunkenness to thirst, Deuteronomy 29, 19. And this, for the most part, blinds the eyes of the wise men of this world. They neither see nor understand any of the works of God, though never so full of dread or terror, because being secure in their sin, they know not that they have any concernment in them. If they do at any time attend to them, it is as the people did to the voice that came from heaven unto our Savior. Some said it thundered, others that an angel spoke. One says one thing of them, another, another thing, but they endeavor not to come to any certainty about them. This is complained of in Isaiah 26.11. Lord, when your hand is lifted up, they will not see. The lifting up of the hand in general is to work or to affect anything, in particular to correct, to punish. It be in the posture of one ready to strike, or redoubling his blows in striking as God does when his judgments are in the earth. Verse 9. In the state of things, saith the prophet, they will not see. 
They will neither consider nor endeavor to understand the mind of God in his works and judgments. And how does God take this of them? saith he, The fire of thine enemies shall devour them. That is, either their own fiery envy at the people of God, mentioned in the foregoing words, shall consume themselves, they shall be eaten up and consumed with it, while they will not take notice of the mind of God and his judgments towards them, or the fire in which at length you will consume all your adversaries, shall fall upon them, or lastly you will turn in upon them a wicked, furious people, who shall destroy them as it befell the Jews, to whom he speaks in particular. One way or other God will severely revenge the security and neglect of his works thereon. But they who will wisely consider their own condition, how it is between God and them, wherein they have been faithful, wherein false or backsliding, what controversy God has or may justly have with them, what is the condition of the state, church, or nation whereunto they belong, will discern the voice of God in his great works of providence. So is the manner stated in Daniel 12.10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And when shall this be? When there is a time of great trouble, verse 1, when God's judgments are greatly in the world. The end of these troubles is to purify men, to cleanse them by the removal of all filth of flesh and spirit that they may have contracted, as dross is taken away from silver in the furnace, and to make them white by causing their sincerity, constancy, and perseverance in their holy profession to appear in their trials. But the wicked men secure in their sins shall yet continue in their wickedness, and by this shall be so blinded that none of them shall understand the mind of God and his great works and tremendous dispensations. But they that have an understanding in their own state and condition, and in the state of things in the church of God, as it is said of the men of Issachar, that they were knowing in the seasons, they shall understand, or come to the knowledge of the will of God, and their duty in these things. And of a failure in this, see how God complains in Deuteronomy 32, 28, and 29. Secondly, that we consider what peculiar impressions of his will God puts upon any of his works. By this we may know much of his mind and design in them. All the works of God, if duly considered, will be found to bear his image and superscription. They are all like him, were sent by him, and are becoming him. They have on them tokens and marks of infinite wisdom, power, and goodness. Those of providence which he intends to be instructive have a peculiar impression of the design of God upon them, and a wise man may see the eye of God in them. So he speaks in the psalmist, I will guide thee with mine eye. Psalm 32, 8. He would make him see the way and path that he was to walk in, by that respect which he would have to them in the works of his providence. This then, I say, we should inquire after and wisely consider. Because observation 21, the greater evidence that God gives of his power and goodness in any of his works, the louder is his voice in them, and the greater is the sin of them that neglect them. Which also is another proposition from the words. God made then his works evident to them so that they saw them. They saw my works so that they could not deny them to be his. But if men will shut their eyes against the light, they justly perish in their darkness. God sometimes hides his power, Habakkuk 3, 4. That was the hiding of his power. That is, as the Targumus adds, it was laid open. His power, that before was hid from the people, was now manifested. But sometimes he causes it to shine forth, as it is said in the same place. He had horns coming out of his hand. Horns are shining beams. Rays of glory arose from his hand or his power and a manifestation of it in his works. He caused his power to shine forth in them as the sun gives out light and its full strength and beauty. Then for men not to take notice of them will be a signal aggravation of their sin and hastening of their punishment. Now we can never know what appears of God in his works unless by due consideration of them we endeavor to understand them or his mind in them. Observation 22 because the end of all God's works of his mighty works of providence towards a person, a church, or nation, is to bring them to faith and repentance, which is also another observation that the words afford us. This end he still declared in all his dealings with his people. 
and it is the principal design of the book of Deuteronomy to improve the works of God which they had seen to this end. And who is wise? And he shall understand these things, prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein, Hosea 14.9. And in this lies the great aggravation of the misery of the days in which we live. The works, the great works of God, are generally either despised or abused. Some account all that is spoken of them as a mere fable, as some did of old the things concerning the resurrection of Christ upon the first report of it, Luke 24.11. And if they are not so in themselves, but that such things as are spoken of are done in the world, yet as to their relation to God they esteem it a fable. Chance, natural causes, vulgar errors, Popular esteem were the originals with such persons of all those great works of God, which our eyes have seen, or our ears heard, or which our fathers have reported to us. Brutish persons and unwise, there is scarce a leaf in the book of God, or a day in the course of his providence, that does not judge and condemn the folly and stupidity of their pride. The very heathen of old, either by reason scorned or by experience, were made afraid to give countenance to such atheism. Nor do I esteem such persons who live in an open rebellion against all that is within them and without them, against all that God has done or said, worthy any consideration, because they regard not the works of the Lord nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them and not build them up. Psalm 28, 5. Others will not deny God to be in his works, but they make no use of them but to gaze, admire, and talk. There is somewhat less evil in this than in the former atheism, but no good at all. Yea, where God multiplies his calls by his works, men by this slight consideration of them insensibly harden their hearts to security. Others abuse them, some by making them the rise of their vain and foolish prognostications. There is such a prodigy, such a strange work of God, such a blazing star, or the like. What then? Such or such a thing shall follow this or that year, this or that month. This is a specious way in which atheism exalts itself, for nothing can give countenance to these presumptions but a supposition of such a concatenation of causes and effects as shall exclude the sovereign government of God over the world. Others contend about them, some whose lives are profligate, and whose ways are wicked are afraid lest they should be looked on as pointed against them in their sins. And therefore they contend that they have no determinate language, no signification in them. Others are too forward to look upon them as sent or wrought to countenance them in their desires, ways, and aims. Amongst most, by these and the like means, the true design of God and all his great and strange works is utterly lost to the great provocation of the eyes of its glory. This, as I have showed, is every man's faith, repentance, and obedience which how they have been improved in us by them we may do well to consider.